Hey, how's it going? It is. Hi, okay. sorry about that. It was just a CBS was very backed up. I guess all their, oh. their vaccines didn't come in on time or something. So, yeah. No worries <laughs> at all. That's so important. Yeah. You got, you just got your shot? Yeah, the booster. So, okay. yeah. I don't know how my body will take it. Last, my last vaccines were just fine. Like I did not feel a single thing. And okay. so the pharmacist said, well, people who didn't feel the, the first two probably will feel this one. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, right. That's uh, one of my deacons did not have much um, reaction to the first two, but was really uh, knocked out with the, the booster. And yeah. and my wife too, Ashley, she was, she was okay with the first two, but then the booster knocked her out. Oh man. Wow. The second, the second one was the worst for me. I was, I felt all the side effects. I had a fever. I had chills. I was nauseous. Um, fortunately, I was also tired, so I could sleep through most of it. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, but it was rough. And I, I'm glad I planned my schedule so that I had nothing going that day. Um, yeah. So hopefully you have nothing going on tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I actually tomorrow is pretty chill. So that's what we're Good. Bring my daughter's Emily that's here. <laughs> Emily. Behind me. <laughs>
um, there was some sort of perfected ideal of what it looked like to be a holy Christian. And I, I could easily fit that mold if I wanted to. I just didn't want to anymore. Mm. Um, and I didn't like it that other people weren't able to fit the mold as easily as I was. So I met my husband, Jason, at a camp called Hume Lake. We were both, um, we were both counselors for the high schoolers, and we'd been going since we were in uh, junior high, actually. We met, yeah, we met in 2000 and got married in 2001. So we'll be 21 years married next, in February. Oh, congratulations. And, yeah. So, so uh, that's like what, uh, kind of east of Fresno? It is, yeah, yeah. So is that near where you grew up? Did you say that, that you... No, I grew up in the Bay Area, in the East okay. Bay of Concord. Yeah. So that's where all my family, my parents still live there. Got Jason's it. from LA in Burbank. So once we met and got married, we went to school for undergraduate at um, a school called uh, Vanguard University, and it's an Assemblies of God school oh. in Orange County in Costa Mesa. So we went to school there. Jason got his degree in some sort of pastoral ministry, and I got mine in psychology. Oh. Um, and then we moved up to Humboldt uh, to start Catalyst Church. And that was 15 years ago. So we started Catalyst wow. 15 Why? years ago. Why Humboldt? What's that? Why Humboldt? Why Humboldt? Good question. <laughs> um, so when we were at Vanguard, we were in we were living in this housing area called Married Student Housing. So it was a bunch of students who were married. And we met another another couple there named Dan and Rachel. They were both from Fortuna. And Dan and Jason would go on these long runs together. And Dan had these big dreams of coming back to Humboldt County, mainly Fortuna, and starting a Christian college. And Jason and Dan like would connect on that all the time. And one day Jason said, I, I totally believe in your heart for this, but what do you think of starting a church first and like kind of planting yourself there? And Dan said, yeah. And then they just started planting, like planning on planting a church together. And um, so they planned it for about three years. They were both on staff at a church called Rock Harbor down in Costa Mesa, which is a non-denominational, um, it'd be considered a mega church. I think like 5,000 people um, are there. And, and they were able just to like, just to glean all sorts of wisdom and information from this large church, um, church plant there. So uh, yeah, so over the course of three years, we started looking at, you know, what's the point of starting another church in an area where there's churches on every corner? What is the need in this area? What do we feel like we can bring and what can we not bring? Um, and we were really honest about a lot of those things. Also really young and immature in many ways as well. Um, but yeah, we, we came up here and got a small group going and then started Catalyst. Uh, 15 years ago and about five years in four years in the other pastor Dan and his wife Rachel just um, did not feel called to be pastors any longer and okay. through a, a bunch of different things they just felt like they needed to move back down to Southern California so they moved back to I think San Diego and Jay and I both felt like we were really called to continue forth in this church mm. um and then through that time, within like all the complications of Dan and Rachel and the, the things that were happening under the surface, both Jason and I felt like if we had, um, if we were a part of a denomination, maybe we would have had the, the right kind of accountability and people that would invest in us and want to see us grow. And like, we could actually say, hey, this is weird. We don't know how to manage this relationship or we don't know how to like lead our church through some toxic things that are happening um but we didn't have that and we regret that in a lot of ways so for jay and i we felt like we were supposed to for us personally um become a part of a denomination and find some footing and uh and support so we we looked into a lot of things we looked into the lutheran church and to um presbyterian and methodist and we felt we felt really connected with the United Methodist Church in a lot of ways, and a lot of our a lot of our uh, volunteers, our elders, well, our yeah, like our leaders at Catalyst, a lot of them grew up Methodist, and so they were very fond of that denomination. So we were we looked into that, and it felt like it would fit. And this parish that we're at now, Arcadia United Methodist Church, felt like um, it just felt like the Lord was opening up all these different doors for us to 
come in and learn a new denomination. So then we started going to seminary and we will graduate next in, in May. We have one more small class left. Great. Um, and Claremont. At Claremont. Yeah. yeah. Which is a Methodist seminary. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And then in the process of all of that catalyst and the leadership really was very clear about wanting to stay autonomous and not become a part of a denomination. So Jason and I pastor two different churches that have very different DNA with shared pastors and both incredibly beautiful. We do a lot of things together. Bible study is together every week. Um, our Christmas Eve service and Easter are always together. Um, this year it's not together because of we're trying to like keep less people, you know, less people in a building at once. <laughs> um, and we've had share, the shared building catalyst rented space from the Methodist church for the last six years. And then catalyst just got their own space, um, just in May. And so That's we started right. moving there. Right by one of my favorite places to eat slice of humble pie. So good. <laughs> I know. Um, and then through it all, we also, since we moved up here, we we've adopted our three kids. Um, we adopted Isaac and he was in my parents, his birth mom was in my parents Bible study, uh, in the Bay area. And we got Isaac a month after starting Catalyst. Um, so it was a lot of change all at once. And we'd already had 13 previous unsuccessful adoptions uh, come our way where we had children in our home and it just wasn't, we weren't able to keep those, all those children. So that was, it was incredibly devastating uh, for Jason and I, but, but we got Isaac and we were able to adopt him and then, um, we became foster parents a year later and a year after that we we got emily and today's her today's the day that we would have um that we brought her home 12 oh my gosh. 13 years ago 13 years ago yeah well so that that's that note that you erased makes all the more sense emily was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then um and then we got antonio a year after that so we have they're all very connected with their birth families and uh, we try to see them as much as we can. And um, yeah, it's been a, a wild oh. journey. Thank you for sharing all that. So Isaac, Emily, and Antonio. Yeah. Wow, that is a full house. That's beautiful. It is. It is. Um, and I love, I love how you talked about kind of what drew you both to a denomination, because I also grew up non-denominational, had some sort of suspicion of denominations, but yeah. this this kind of craving for accountability or some sort of larger structure, some larger community, yes. um, some grounding, some footing. That's, that's what helped me appreciate um, denominations and then discover, okay, where, where do my gifts and my mm. passions and interests resonate most deeply with a particular denomination? Mm. You have this great chapter. I was just talking about this with one of my prisoners on Sunday. Um, several great chapters, but one chapter called Dust, where you, mm. I love how you incorporate Jewish wisdom. I do that all the time. Um, that that Jewish wisdom saying, may, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. Yeah. I'm wondering which, what authors, what teachers um, yeah. have been formative for you? What, whose dust have you been covered in? And I'm, I'm mm. also aware that, um, you know, I've had some, it's been a while, but I was um, having conversations with Tim Doty, who mm -hmm. now attends the uh, Episcopal Church in Arcata. Right. Um, but I know he was connected with with you and Jason early on. Yeah. So tell yeah. me about your your mentors, both uh, those you've been in contact uh, in uh, in live interaction and through uh, books and texts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tim has been wonderful. He's very close with Jason. They try to get together about once a month. Oh, good. And he was the pastor at the Presbyterian Church when Catalyst rented space there. So okay. he he's really poured so much of himself, his wisdom into Jason. And um, he would Jason would definitely consider him one of his greatest mentors. Um, yeah, for myself, uh, definitely have learned at the feet of quite a number of incredible people. Uh, I always like to find authors who who aren't just thinking theoretically about theology, but actually live it out in their lives. Sometimes being in seminary, I feel like 
professors and theologians can be removed from the real stuff of life sometimes. And I, and while I learn from that, um, it doesn't impact me in the same way as taking theory, you know, putting it into practice, praxis, of course. So um, I, when it comes to like the dust of your rabbi, I, I think I remember hearing that for the first time from Brian McLaren and he wrote a book. I think it's called the dust of your rabbi hmm. i'm not sure where it is on my shelf right now but brian mclaren was somebody who like helped me deconstruct a little bit in the beginning of my walk with of, of, of becoming a pastor um i was raised in a in a church culture that women weren't even allowed to pray in front of the church um wow. there were no women leaders except for like women's ministry in my church or Sunday school, they could lead the kids, but no teenagers or anything like that. So uh, I remember preaching my first sermon after we started Catalyst, because both Jan Dan and Jason had this ideal that there wouldn't be just one person in the pulpit all the time, that we would have a, a kaleidoscope of voices. And when I, re I remember preaching my first sermon and I remember thinking, how am I, why do I feel like I'm called to something that God would never approve of? Hmm. Yeah. And that was a really difficult thing for me to wrestle with for a long time. Uh, this last Sunday I spoke on, well, I, I preached on what we're in in the lectionary. So it was John the Baptist and he was, you know, Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers. That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, and I spoke a lot about metanoia, about the sense of um, the repentance of, of a changed perspective and once you see something, you can't unsee it, essentially. And I felt like in that moment of me preaching my first sermon, once I saw this state of who I was in this sort of place, hmm. I couldn't unsee it. And I had to continue forth in that metanoia. I had to hmm. discover more about what that meant scripturally and for my own self personally. So I started looking at different authors who wrote about that. I think Rachel Held Evans was an important person in my life uh, for a long time. I saw her speak. The first time I ever heard of her was at a conference called Big Tent Christianity, and it was in Phoenix. It was 11 years ago, so this is all very new to me in a lot of ways. 11 years ago isn't that long ago, but um, Claremont had put it on before I even knew what Claremont was. Mm. And uh, Nadia Goldsweber was there, and Marcus Borg, and um, Brian McLaren, just really incredible people that helped me kind of unpack a lot of the areas of my life that were keeping me away from experiencing the fullness of God. Hmm. And so she's been an important author in my own life. N.T. Wright has been really important to me. Um, Rob Bell still is a very important person in it when it comes to his perspective. Uh, there's another pastor named Mike Erie, and he's been hmm. uh, a, an important voice in my own life. And he was the pastor at Rock Harbor before we moved up here. Um, and he has a podcast called Voxology and it's a, it's really good. Uh, Phyllis Tickle is another person I'm trying to look at my bookshelf. Um, yeah. You got some good, good Anglicans in there. They're, Anglicans um, are kind of the best. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, so yeah, Rachel Held Evans, you know, I, I never read her, um, searching for Sunday, but my mm. understanding, she ends up finding a home in, in Episcopal, a small parish. Yep. Yep. All right, well, tell me now about uh, this book, Stepping Into Advent. Um, what inspired you to, to write um, a book, a specific, specifically an Advent book, and um, mm. tell us about the process of writing. It's, it seems like you, uh, I'm understanding you, read, you wrote it last year while we were in the midst of the COVID lockdown. Yeah. And it's still so relevant for us today. Um, sadly, it still is, but it, um, I'm glad these, these words still speak to us. Um, and then the publishing process and and um, the creation of With Bethany Publishing. And obviously, I, I know Jason was, was part of this. Yes, yeah. Uh, so I did. I wrote it last year. And last, uh, so in the fall 2020, um, both Jason and I decided not to take any seminary courses. And because we were homeschooling our kids and pastoring two churches through a pandemic, and we just felt like the last thing we needed was multiple courses on top of that. Yeah. So 
it gave me the opportunity to step into Advent differently than I had in the past six years. Being in seminary, my coursework isn't done until middle of Advent. I just turned in a 15 page paper last night. So now I can finally begin Advent. So last last year I had the space to really um, sink into it differently. And I have felt for a long time that Advent sometimes isn't what I want it to be. I have some sort of idealized version of how I should behave or feel or experience these certain uh, Christian seasons that lead up to something really profound, Advent and Lent being the two that I think of most often. And so I was wondering what it would look like if I created my own spiritual practice of writing. And I follow a book, I don't have it here with me, but it's a it's called um, a book of, I think it's called the book of prayer for ministers and other servants. Yeah. Does it look like this? Yep. Yep. That's the one. I've, a, gu I've been... a, guide, a guide to prayer. Yeah. A guide to prayer. Oh, I love that book. I've been reading it for 20 years and I just followed the scriptures for it each day. And I would read the scripture and in early morning before my kids woke up, it was still dark out and I would get my coffee and I'd read my scripture and I'd just like meditate on it. And I'd just start writing and even the way I write my sermons are the same way. It's just, I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know what I'm, what my end goal is. I just start writing and see what happens. And so I would do that every morning with that passage of scripture. And then I would, I, I would publish it on my blog, which my blog is very small, small amount of people would read it. And, and that was fine. It was really my own spiritual practice. Yeah. So I did that every day throughout Advent. And then I did it again throughout Lent. So I've got another book called coming out, stepping into Lent, and that will come out in at the end of February, Great. middle of February, right before Lent starts. Um, and, it, and it was that same sort of practice of sitting in the space and really allowing my heart and my mind to be transformed, to have a metanoia of sorts. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that and I, and then I've been working with a coach, a mentor named Justin McRoberts, phenomenal person love that guy and i've been working with him for quite some time on a different book that i've been writing called dandelion theology and it's um a book about the theology of adoption and why paul would have used that terminology and what it would have meant for the people then and what it could mean to us today and then i share a little bit of my own story of adoption in that and every time i would reach out to an agent to see if they would be interested in you know, working with me. I just kept getting doors shut because they would say adoption books were so 10 years ago and they didn't want to take a chance on somebody who it was unknown. I, I'm obviously an unknown person. I don't have like a major following and um, it's, it's a big, it's a big risk for them to do that. Yeah. So when I was thinking about that step in that dandelion theology book, I was talking to Justin and Justin just said, well, why don't you take some of the stuff you've already written and put it together and then self-publish? And I thought about it for a while. I felt a little, um, I don't know. I don't know what the word would be, like, not embarrassed, but just like bummed that it would have to be that way. Mm -hmm. And, but then I just realized, you know, I can't wait for somebody else to take a chance on me. I just need to go ahead and put out what I have because I think it's important work and other people will be blessed by it if I put it out there. So yeah. I did. And, um, and Jason helped me with it. It's all through Kindle publishing. So uh, Amazon is a, is a tricky place for me because there's a lot about Amazon that is really helpful for people and a lot that's really yucky with capitalism and all the things and Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So the, I, I have a mixed, mixed feelings about it all, which I think is the right, I think we're meant to, to be in that place of discomfort. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, we did that together, Jason and I worked on it for a while and I, I sent it to different people to look at it and how it looked. And I, I have an editor and she worked out a lot of the details as well of what works better and doesn't. And, um, and then we just press send and it went, it was ready to be published and it was just, it was that easy. Wow. So yeah. And it's, it's done surprisingly well, I think in a lot of ways, like, um, I mean, it's, yeah, I've just been, I, it's been surprising to see how many people have read it that I've never known before. I didn't, I haven't met these people yeah. and yet they've like, they've bought 
a book of mine and that feels really weird and wonderful <laughs> yeah there's there's something about having i mean i read blogs all the time but there's something about having a book yeah tangible artifact totally. um, and especially maybe you know other generations that aren't as used to or don't want to be staring at a screen want to you know go out and grab a book and go sit outside or go yeah. sit in the corner i mean as you explained in the introduction like this is a book where you can go find a corner go grab your favorite drink and get a cozy blanket <laughs> get some tea or coffee and yeah, yeah that's it's I'm so glad you so glad you made it yeah. um so tell me about the the name with bethany was that just oh yeah yeah so I, I i was trying to figure out like a name for this blog that i was starting and i'd asked a bunch of people what they thought and a lot of things were already taken when it came came to the name bethany and um somebody mentioned what about with bethany and i and I, so then I just started writing it like that. So my blog is called with Bethany and then okay. everything that I write, I, I end with, with, with love Bethany and the love is just, you know, put off to the side because it doesn't, it, it's not my handle on the website or whatever, but, um, got it. Got it. I see. And, and also I just, I feel like that word love, I mean, anything can be put into that same little space. I think okay, sometimes yeah. there's a with hope or with gratitude, with joy, gratitude. Right. totally, totally. Right. Um, but yeah, love, love comes really easy for me. I, I love people really, really easily. It doesn't take too much effort. Well, excellent. And yeah, I want to talk about belovedness as, um, a really important theme and, and the way you talk about that really resonates with, um, a perspective I've gained over the years about, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to being called to love one another, um, as we are called to do by Christ, um, we really need to start or at least have some basis of self-love. Yeah. Um, and when I ask myself, well, why do, why would I love myself? All the reasons that come to me, I find kind of empty. I mean, mm -hmm. well, I'm, I, what, I, I'm a pastor. Okay. Is that, I mean, what if, what if I'm no longer a pastor? Does that mean I can't love myself? I mean, well, whatever identities I find they're they're not solid enough for me to be like, that's the reason to love myself, except for the truth, the ultimate truth that I'm a beloved child of God. I'm a creation of God. And for me not to love myself is actually hubris. It's actually mm -hmm. to, to say that something God made and God loved is, not worthy of love and, and what kind of arrogance is that right um right. belovedness so let's let's talk more about that um yeah you say it was in and this i, I quoted in, in i think the first sermon during advent it was in this lonely and vulnerable place where i began to accept my belovedness and let me just say i mean th that's one thing people really appreciate about this book um mm -hmm. in my parish is just your your vulnerability as well as I think somebody on Amazon said this, how you you gently get to the point. <laughs> um, there are a lot of Advent books out there. I mean, I have probably 50. Um, wow. A lot of them are really good, but <laughs> sometimes it's just like uh, like several pages of just kind of meandering thought, whereas you, you gently get to the point and one can leave each day being like, okay, this was like the main point of that day. And... And I also get the sense that as you're writing, you're, you're kind of letting, you're as you just said, you're not sure what the point is going to be, <laughs> right? but but it comes out, and you're like, okay, this is this is the point I want to, I want to emphasize. Um, but I liked how it was one of the early chapters where you talk about just the, the pain of 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 loss, um, and the vulnerability, and it was in that place where you kind of. Maybe you've lost other identities or other sources of, um, excuse me, somebody's calling. Yeah. Other source. This is actually my seminary roommate from Fuller Seminary. No and way. and at the Rector's Forum Live, when we were, um, I was uh, meeting with uh, a woman on Mary Magdalene feast day. Mm -hmm. um, he actually walked in like right in the middle of the chancel. He didn't, it was his first time there. I was like, what? And then he realized where he was and he walked out. <laughs> so he's got, he's got a, a pattern here. Nice. Um, but when oh, you were losing. We went, to, we went to Fuller for a few years. 
Oh, you did. Two years. Oh, it was great. Love I love Fuller. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> love to talk more about Fuller. Yeah. Um. So yeah, when you've lost sort of other sources of of maybe self worth, that's when you began to accept your belovedness. Um. And God has slowly shifted me away from thinking of myself as, you know, all these negative things. These the voice of the the accuser, the Satan, like lazy, unintelligent, non-relevant, uninteresting, to, no, I'm beloved, I'm valuable, I'm worthy, I'm wanted. Um, and actually at Fuller, since you brought it up, um, I had uh, Professor Marianne May Thompson, I don't know if she was, if you I ever had her. She, she taught the gospel, she taught John, and she asked this class of probably 50 of us, many of whom had a lot of experience in um, in ministry, and she said, "How would you define the kingdom of God?" Which is what mm -hmm. Jesus talks about more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And nobody had much to say um, mm -hmm. because even if you trace Christian theology, theologians don't talk so much about the kingdom of God. Um, and so, one I one helpful perspective that came to me was connected with what you're saying here. You know, there are, you don't have to be schizophrenic to have like voices in our heads, right? Like voices yeah. saying, I'm lazy, unintelligent. Yeah. Um, but when I give the most authority to the voice that says those words that were spoken to Jesus, you are my child, my mm -hmm. beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. That's when I'm, I think I'm coming from the most spiritually healthy, stable place. Yeah, and so that's that's how I start to think about the kingdom of God is is any place, any soul, but also any place where that that voice of love reigns supreme over all other voices. There are other voices there, but they all are subject to yeah. the voice of love. Yeah, and I love that you you brought in baptism. Um, so beyond speaking words of love to ourselves, um, remind myself, no, I'm, I'm a beloved child of God. I am worthy. Um, what other spiritual practices or sacraments have you found to be effective in, in deepening that, that true identity mm. and revealing that true identity as God's beloved and our experience of our belovedness? Yeah, it's a great question. There's just the typical practices of like sitting in that prayer book every morning and being in God's word every day. Um, and that's incredibly helpful for me. I, when I feel like things are, when I feel like I'm running on empty, um, our, my kids have, they just have a lot of uh, emotional difficulties. Adoption sometimes does that. And now they're all teenagers too, so they're also very hormonal. Yeah. Uh, I I step outside my front door and I just look up in the hills and I and I pray that prayer that the psalmist prays. You know, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heavens and earth. So I, I look to the mountains and ask. That's what he says. Um, but the thing that reminds me most is actually community, being in a beloved community. I go on walks multiple days a week with different parishioners who are struggling with things or just needing to pray together and just talk about real life stuff. And it's there that I'm able to remind them of who they are and they remind me of who I am. Uh, it's a very symbiotic relationship in many ways between me and the people that I love. And I think um, the more, I mean, the same thing as we were talking about before the kaleidoscope of voices, the more we can have those voices speaking into our lives, not from like, well, I'm the pastor, I've got God's word or something. I'm, I'm the one in authority. I think that I just have more time to do it, but we're all a priesthood. We're all, we all have a word to bring to each other. Um, so on, on Sundays at Catalyst, we, we dialogue a lot in the service. So usually myself or some other, some other person will be bringing God's word, the message, the reflection out of whatever passage of scripture we're in. And we, pepper the whole thing with guiding questions to help people engage with it on the level that they need to engage with it. So instead of it being some sort of lecture that we're providing, uh, it's, it's much more 
conversational. And that way, you know, when people, people can listen to a lecture or listen to a sermon and sermons are great. I think that sermons, I think one of the most offensive things is, is a boring sermon. Um, you know, we've got, we've got 20, 30 minutes with these people once a week that they've carved out. And the last thing I want to do is put them to sleep because God's word should never be boring. It just should not. It is. I don't need to like give them a song or dance or some sort of like throwing a joke here or there, some sort of like, you know, TV clip to engage them. That's not necessary, but like actually engaging them where they, where it, it's sitting within them and it can like permeate their mind and their heart throughout the whole week. So the thing that I've noticed is that when they can speak out the truth that the Holy Spirit has placed on their heart, when they can make ver when they can like voice it, it actually stays with them differently. Even if it is nothing that I brought whatsoever and it has nothing to do with the message, but yet the Holy Spirit placed them on that, when they can say it out loud, that's what they're going to take with them. And so we try to, I try to tease that out as much as we can in service. And we don't always agree. Sometimes there's like some arguments or I just don't see it that way or you know, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just like, I try to do a lot more asking. So what do you think? And yeah. why do you feel that? And um, does anybody have a different idea of that or anybody experience the same thing? And it, it, it's been really helpful. It works almost every time. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it gets a little chaotic, but yeah, learning the, the beloved community is where I've really experienced my own sense of belovedness. Mm. Right. Well, and it's it's in that it's in that body of Christ that you are sharing your gifts yeah. and um, that people crave. Um, I mean, yes, you, I think, yes, we are. Uh, we believe as Anglicans, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. <clears throat> we still have ordained ministers, but right. it's sort of more in a sense administrative, but it's also um, it's in a sense administrative, but it's also speaking to a level of of training and education right because when we are dealing with scripture and we you and i both know um i mean in some ways from our upbringing but also just look around at sort of the dominant voices in christianity how toxic <laughs> and lethal and dangerous scripture can be when oh, put yeah. in the hands of people who are just power hungry oh yeah um, frightening and so so uh, so that I mean, I, I love the idea of giving more voice to to pastors like you who like you see that the main point of scripture is really about basking in our belovedness and then and using not using that, but um, coming from that identity to to love others and serve others. Definitely. And and using our gifts and doing so. So I can understand how being in a, a community where you are using your gifts, you mm -hmm. you are so appreciated for the gifts that are so desired and you're so beloved by others. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk about expectations. I like that you said Advent is not what I, sometimes not what I want it to be. And mm -hmm. I can relate to that. It's like, oh, it's Advent and I'm going to have all this time to do all these things. And oh my gosh, Advent's gone and now it's Christmas. Um, and I feel like the the theme of expectations is such an important theme in Advent. It's an important theme in our readings. I love the the quote you have. Um, I hadn't heard the. I don't think I'd heard this before. So if you came up with it, kudos to you. I, I love it. This chosen one, the Messiah, was expected to kick ass, not ride one. <laughs> uh, so it's you know Jesus is subverting. Yeah. I mean that's what he's always doing: subverting expectations for the Messiah. Yeah. Um, but then you also talk about disappointments, unmet expectations for yourself. Um, you know, you said how I expected my life and ministry to turn out. Just, it wasn't happening the way I, I expected. Um, and another great quote, I would rather stay in bed with a pint of Ben and Jerry's brownie ice cream while binge watching Schitt's Creek, which is a great show. When <laughs> things get too difficult and life becomes disappointing, mm -hmm. I think, I can relate to that. So it's sometimes the disappointments, those those unmet expectations that can really be the source of some of the the greatest um, sorrow and grief. Definitely. So I'm wondering um, if any of your expectations for this book have been um, exceeded or maybe subverted. Um, 
What has been most surprising to you about about writing and publishing this book and, and about its reception? I mean, you've already shared a little bit about that, but yeah. um, what's been most surprising? Um, I think the I think it's obviously super surprising that people that I don't know have been reading it. I think that that's like that's bonkers to me. Um, I want to say really quick about the the sitting in bed and watching Netflix and just trying to like numb out from the le- the disappointments that I experience sometimes and others experience. There is a difference between just like numbing out for a while and and somebody needing more clinical help with what's going on in them. And so um, I I know that this this time of year in general, but just even with, with the pandemic, there is this heightened level of um, of depression and anxiety that is really permeating so many people. Um, and so there's definitely a difference between like just needing to take a time out or a mental health day and actually finding that you just can't get out of bed and function. And so it's important to pay attention to those things, especially with, yeah, just like that sense of complete loss that people are experiencing. Um, yeah, I, I think that yeah, I've been surprised at who's been reading it. And like, for instance, I know this, this might sound really silly, but like there's a review, a couple reviews on, on Amazon from people I don't know. So yeah. it wasn't just like, hey mom, can you review this for me? <laughs> it's actually, actually people that I don't know. And my mom has not reviewed it. So <laughs> happen, but. <laughs> I, can, I can relate to that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, I, I remember hearing from people who have published books before they they've said, just, just don't expect your friends and family to buy your book. They'll, they'll support you and they'll encourage you, but they probably won't buy it. And just to see like friends and family actually buying it and reading it, um, has been really, really neat to see that too. And that people have been impacted with it. Um, I've had a couple of typos that people have found, so that's a little embarrassing, but also, you know, it's self-published and people are full of grace, which is wonderful. Yeah. And even books that aren't self-published have typos. I can, I can relate to that. I, That's true. I shared a book with someone and he came back and showed me a typo and I was like, ah, it, and now like every time I see the book, I'm like, ah, there's that typo. Um, but, but yet it's like, as I said with, uh, you know, that, that hell he that we'll talk about. I mean, yes. in some yeah. ways I feel like the spirit, the spirits at work and even those, those typos. Yes. Um, yes. I, I do appreciate, I mean, it's obviously you have training and a degree in psychology, but I, I do appreciate your sensitivity to, um, to clinical anxiety. Um, you say in between gratefully rejoicing in Jesus, peace, wholeness, and thinking about the good, there's a little room for anxiety and worry to fester in your heart and affect your perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, so much of what I heard growing up in the church is, you know, if you're worried and anxious, then you're really not truly accepting Christ's love for you. Yeah, um, it's and, a mark of unfaithfulness or something. Right, and that just yeah. that just makes it worse. Um, and you you say, friends, I'm speaking about non-clinical anxiety and worry. There mm-hmm. are some brains where rejoicing in Jesus means needing a little extra serotonin boost to get there. And Glenn Doyle sings out, Jesus loves me, this I know because he gave me Lexapro. I love that. <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate your, your sensitivity to that. Yeah. The theme that is in the subtitle of your book, um, Making Space to Recognize the Nearness of God. Mm-hmm. Um, you say, Avin is the reminder of the God who comes near. The very nature and character of God is one of nearness. Yeah. And that that was uh, kind of a, a new perspective for me. I thought, oh, that, I don't know if that's, that's always the first thing that comes to mind when I think of God. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if we think of love, that's this, this closeness, this nearness. Um, and then you talk about the cross um, and you're clearly unpacking um, some of the theology of the cross that I think you and I were both um, fed growing up and that's you know penal substitutionary theory that we're so gross and disgusting and nasty um god couldn't bear looking at us so he killed his excessively worthy son so that we can finally be okay in god's eyes and that's i mean at at the time i guess that that did speak to me (laughs) but 
yeah, I guess come high school and college, I'm like, ooh, that's that's kind of disturbing. Yeah. Um, and I like how you say, no, the cross is really, um, it's an expression of the hell removing nearness of God. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, tell, tell me about your kind of evolution in thinking about the cross and, and how it's an expression of that nearness of God. Mm. Yeah. Um, I should probably read that, that day again, but um, yeah. So, I, yeah. Yeah. The cross. Um, so the hell removing nearness of God is seen in a garden and a covenant and wrestling with Jacob in a cloud and fire yeah. and a tabernacle and the vulnerable womb of a teenage girl, yeah. the multiplication of bread and fish and the communion table of bread and wine. Mm. Um, and it, in this, this, hell removing nearness of God hands us a new theology when God hung from that cross through the sacrificial love all the power of hell began to unravel Mm. revealing how weak hell truly is when compared to God's love (laughs) should be two at the end of the key (laughs) yeah H-E double hockey sticks yes Um, you've got the hockey sticks but but he he, he still he still works I mean yeah the devil is part of our cosmology right right um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's such a big theological question. Um, I think that the cross, the cross represents the nearness of God and the way that, um, uh, do you ever read anything by Rene Girard? Yes. He talks about, uh, a lot about scapegoat theology or scapegoat yeah. ideas. Um, and this sense of, somebody was needed in order to make, I mean, in, in the idea of like a, of a tribal mentality and the way of like ancient tribal thinking, um, if the gods are angry at the things that you're doing, at the way that you're living your life, at the way the tribe is acting and the rain's not coming or, um, or there's too much flooding or the crops aren't producing or wh- whatever it is that's happening in the world around those ancient peoples, uh, then the gods who, create all these things or who, who manage all these things must be upset in some way. And so, I mean, I, I know that you know all these things, but like we need to give um, my, our first fruits, we need to give more and more and more so to appease the gods. And if the gods are still angry, then maybe what they're demanding is the thing that is most important to us, which is our firstborn child, mm. the most important, most valuable thing, which is fascinating that God um, in numbers, we read about God, like, um, uh, declaring a set apart people out of his set apart out of God's set apart people with the Levites being the special ones. Um, and, and it almost was a way, especially as they're like going into Canaan where there's, where's, where the God is Baal and child sacrifice was something that happened back then. Um, there was no firstborn, uh, perfection of people that the Israelites could then utilize to appease the gods like Baal. So the Levites became this piece of the people and therefore child sacrifice was something that was no longer needed according to the ideas of numbers. Anyway, yeah. so within scapegoat theology, is that the way I'm saying right now? Scapegoat theology, is that what it is? The scapegoat mechanism. Mechanism, thank you. Yeah. Um, there, if we can put all the blame, all the shame, all the problems on this one person who will then be sacrificed for the good of the tribe, then everyone gets along and they all get happy and everybody's um, in, a, in a good state. The tribe is happy together. They can move forward in peace and harmony until something bad happens again. And then they can all come around one person that they can then sacrifice. And the idea of the cross then is this sense of like, if we can just put... If, if God can put all of the blame and shame and disappointment and anger and wrath upon uh, God's beloved son, and then God would be, Nadia Boltz Weber says this really well. She says, you know, it's like God is, um, God is looking down above the cross and looking down at his son and being like, oh, you are so gross. I cannot even believe, I, I, can't, I have to turn my face from you. I can't believe you are doing this. Like, like that you have all of this on you. You're, I, you have all the sin of the world because of all these horrible people. Yeah. It's not so much as God looking down at the cross in disappointment. It's God hanging from the cross and saying, Father, forgive them because yeah. they don't understand what they're doing. Yeah. And so instead of it being the sense of um, 
we just need to put all of our blame and shame on Christ and he's going to take that for us, which I do believe that there is part of that. I do believe that there's truth to, to that, that, that Jesus is capable of holding those things for us. Yeah. I don't think that's why Jesus died. I think Jesus died because God knew that the only way that people could ever experience the nearness of God, the true nearness of God is to, is to be able to take all of that from us that those those are human expectations that we've placed on god not god expectations that god has placed on god if that does that make sense i know i'm oh no it totally makes sense and i'm okay. so, i'm so glad when you said gerard i was just like ding 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 <laughs> i mean that yeah i and I, I i'm excited because you said that so beautifully and um now my parishioners who hear me talk about gerard all the time you know that i'm not i'm not it's not just daniel's obsession it's actually it's actually so great. a I lot know. of people's understanding of the cross. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that was huge for me because, yeah, growing up, it was really to be a Christian was to was to accept this particular understanding of the cross, penal substitutionary atonement. If yeah. you don't believe that, then you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal savior in this way. Right. You're really not Christian. And to then be exposed to even, even the Roman Catholic Church where they say, yes, the cross is salvific, but... We're not going to tell you exactly how We're, there are these theories, but they're theories. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not, the, it's not fact. It's, this is how we're trying to understand it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's been really helpful for me to see that um, the violence and wrath and mm -hmm. compulsion to blame is not God's, it's ours. Yeah. And God says, okay, like if you need, if you, if you need and that, you humans need to do that. I'll take it, but please know this is—it's <laughs> not me. I'm yeah. not the one who's um, who's bloodthirsty. It's you, and I will receive all of that um, and respond with love, which is what Jesus does, right? He's, as you said, Father, forgive them. And then even after that, even after he's buried, he comes back and says, as he says to Peter, who denied him and who was complicit in all of this, "Do you love me?" Do you love yeah. me? I mean, what is more disarming than that? After I am complicit in unleashing all of my rage and violence onto God and and God in Christ saying to me, do you love me? Like, let's mm -hmm. continue this genuine covenant interaction as Walter Brueggemann talks about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Mm. Um. I, I want to be sensitive of, of our time, so I'm just going to have a couple more questions. But, yeah. you know, this is the season of Advent, and we await the the first coming of Christ and this, this vulnerable baby. Um, but we also look forward to the, the Perusia, the second coming. Um, mm -hmm. And when you were talking about the hell-removing nearness of God, I um, and, the, and I started thinking about the devil, um, I wondered, you know, can Jesus bring the hell removing nearness of God into hell itself in this harrowing of the hell, mm. harrowing of hell um, that that is talked about in in Ephesians? Jesus ascended into the lower earth, earthy earthly regions. C.S. Lewis talks about people in hell being invited out, yeah. um, and then the great theologian Origen of Alexandria talks about it, the ultimate end. There's this apocatastasis, this ultimate restoration, where even the devil is restored. Mm. Um, and you have you say, I have faith that there will be a future arrival, making all things right. This future shalom. Um, and I, I I find that really in, encouraging. I I need that, and that's what we as Christians believe especially in light of what so many, some of the greatest thinkers of our day are saying that we as a human species are, are, are doomed. Like it's already, it's already set. Like we're not going to make it. Um, but I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering um, what my question is here, but what do you imagine that that final restoration to be that final when the hell removing nearness of God comes near to all of us, can that encompass even even hell so that hell becomes a, an empty place or can it encompass even the devil? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have the best theology on hell. Um, I, I 
haven't done enough study on it. And so I, I don't know about all of that. I mean, I, I know what I believe right now. And <laughs> uh, what I believe right now is that, um, that God, God's way more powerful than anything else. And some, I think as Christians, as Protestants, and for me growing up Baptist, especially there's this glee in hell away, like a yeah. sense of excitement that, um, a sense of justice that doesn't look like justice. And um, yeah, like I, like, so for instance, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how um, it gives this picture, there's this picture of heaven and there's these pictures of, of these heavenly gates and how it says that the gates never close. Well, why wouldn't the gates close if we have to keep people out? If it's like a way of, of providing shelter and safety for those good Christians who made it in and said the right things and um, you know dotted their I's and crossed their T's as Good Christian people do. Um, why why keep those gates open? And I and I have to believe it's because there is there's never an end, end date for the love of God. Right. God's love doesn't end the minute that we take our last breath. It doesn't end once we get to the state of heavenly bliss. I think God's love goes way beyond any kind of asterisk that we would place on it. Any kind of like speak like we don't yeah so I, I remember listening to a sermon once from oh what's his name francis chan wonderful pastor yeah. he's somebody who absolutely lives out lives out what he believes in in all authenticity and i really respect him a lot but he preached the sermon and I, I don't agree with his theology all the time but he preached the sermon about uh, he had this long rope on on the stage and and he he put some tape around one end of the rope and he said, this is your life. This is it. It's a blip. The rest of it is eternity. Where are you going to go? How will, where will you end up for the rest of your life? And I saw that at the end of that tape is where God's love ended. That's, that's it. That's all you get. If you don't fall in God's love right here, there's no hope for you. And I don't see that as true whatsoever. I see God's love going way beyond the grave and back. Mm. And so I just, I, I believe more in God's love and heaven than I do in hell. And yeah. I believe in everybody else too. Yeah. I do believe in hell. Like I, right. I, I do believe that there is a, a space of, I don't know what it looks like or anything, but some sort of a separation. And I, and I see it already. I see it on earth. And if it happens yeah. on earth and it happens beyond earth, this sense of, um, of just total isolation and, um, an evil in this world that, that yeah, hell exists. I heard somebody say religion is for those who are trying to avoid hell. Spirituality is for those who've already been through hell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Francis Chan preached, I heard him preach several times at, at my alma mater at Westmont College. And I remember him, oh, him showing that and that, <laughs> that, that, that it's effective. I was like, wow. Um, but yeah, and I remember how he, he kind of wrote crazy love i think in somewhat of a response to rob bell's love wins that mm -hmm. got rob bell in so much trouble in the evangelical world totally um whereas for episcopalians we're like i think most episcopalians either we don't believe in hell i believe in hell but either we don't believe in hell or we believe that it's empty or it's there's always a way out it's not like oh you didn't you didn't believe you didn't believe the right things during the short amount of time so you're condemned for eternity that's just that does not compute with anyone's understanding of love yeah let alone the you know the source of all love and loving god um yeah i think god can respect our decision to be distant but i think he's constantly um luring us back in uh and even the psalms say that if i make my bed in sheol if i go to hell you're still there. Like I'm, I can't get away from you. You're, you're, you're right. everywhere. Right. Wow. Um, yeah. And I like to believe that, uh, yeah, nobody knows quite how the final restoration will, or the, the second coming will manifest, but, um, but love wins. Um, yep. so uh, as I said before, I really appreciate how your book acknowledges many of the difficulties and challenges posed by 
by this pandemic, which has been hellish for so many of us, right? I mean, 800,000 people right. lost their lives to this and the, the hell of political division, the hell for, for me and maybe for you and seeing so many people using Christianity to support evil, in my opinion, um, how difficult and hellish and exhausting it's been to lead a church. Um, I'm, I'm wondering in what ways do you see COVID changing your church, but also how do you see it changing the church at large, the church in general? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that we're meant to go back to the way things were. I think that the church is in a great place of being able to reevaluate what matters most. Hmm. What, what do we gather for? And the word church is just, you know, the word ecclesia is, um, it really means gathering. It, it means uh, an assembly. It's not, and we've really equated it to a building or to some sort of sacred spot. But through Christ, and, and the reason that when Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, my assembly, um, it, it wasn't meant to be this like location. There's no spiritual sacred spot for Christians. I mean, there's a lot of them, but none that we like really point to as this is where God resides. And I think that matters because I don't know. I think that the church as, as a construct, as, as like an actual building, I, I just don't know where it's going to end up honestly. And, it, you know, talking to younger, the younger generation, 18, 19 year olds, they're just very disenfranchised with the idea of a building or tithing or any of those things. So I think the entire landscape of Christianity in a building will look very different in about 10 or 20 years. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. So the more we can get out of the building and still, still invite people to recognize the importance of the assembly, of gathering together, of, of paying attention to their own spirituality. I think that's so vital for the future. It doesn't have to happen in a building. And so we need to be really creative about what it looks like to get out of the building. And honestly, throughout COVID, how many of us were out of our buildings? We just were. We, we chose to allow that disruption to invite us to become creative. And I know that there's something safe and nostalgic and comforting about being back in a place that you've experience the love of God most radically in your life. And I don't discount that whatsoever. But to recognize that God's movement goes beyond the walls is really important. And not to like hang on to it and like, well, we need to protect this at all costs. And if you don't understand it, then obviously you just, you're not in the right place or you just aren't mature enough or whatever. I, I think that we need more voices of the younger people to really speak into the life of what church looks like moving forward. Um, and, um, yeah, I, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot there. Cause I do think a building is great for us. We've got, um, what we were surprised by was the amount of people on zoom that started coming. So we have like an entire zoom community that meets, you know, from all over the place. We've got people in Arizona mm -hmm. and the Bay area and out in Reading that are on every single Sunday because Catalyst is their church. Yeah. And they, they, but we have it going the same time. And so whenever we have like questions, I'll always, we have somebody that's running the zoom and I'll ask if anybody on zoom have anything to say. And we try to like include them as much as possible. It's not perfect. We're still working it out, but there's two of our leaders have not been back in the building since COVID and they're on zoom every week. And literally this group prays together and they talk together. They are on with each other well after we're locking the doors after service and people stick around after service for at least like 45 minutes. And this Zoom community is still praying together and talking together. So that's been really surprising to see um, the connections that can happen outside of a building. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we've experienced the same. Yeah. So many people who just for health reasons or or yeah, people who have moved away who were connected with Christ Church and never plugged into another church. They've now reconnected. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I, I mean, when I read the Gospels, I see Jesus saying what you're saying, that it's not like 
don't focus so much on the building. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to understand what Jesus was about in storming oh. the temple, but um, I hear him so often saying to, to everyone that the new temple is your body. I mean, even in John, it says the temple he was referring to is the temple of the body. That's where the Holy Spirit now is, is, uh, is free to dwell, yeah. especially in the body of Christ, which is manifested in the gathering. Yeah. Um, right. And I love that you guys, I know you guys were meeting outside among the Redwoods and, and that's, yeah. you know, within my first couple of years here, I just thought we are so, I mean, we have a beautiful building, beautiful Redwood building. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who just want to be back in there and we are back in there, but I thought, let's be outside. I mean, yeah. we are so, so fortunate. And so we were doing outdoor uh, services, kind of like what you're talking about, walking with parishioners. We, we call it sacred saunter and just oh. an outdoor Eucharist. And um, yeah, I love it. And it's gotten me into to forest bathing and forest therapy. And um, I think <laughs> I think that's, and, and even forest, I have a book called Forest Church. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Forest Church. Oh, I love that. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, a field guide to spiritual connection with nature. Um, and I know that uh, you know our our mutual friend in uh, Destiny. She was she was drawn mm -hmm. to the this uh, these outdoor services. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. COVID's kicking us out. Yeah. In, in good ways. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much. I, there's a lot more I want to talk about, but I want to respect your time. I want to hear about dandelion theology. I want to <laughs> talk about sleeping in church. <laughs> um, and I did want to just share this morning, um, I was talking with my music director and organist, and she was just reading about Hakarat Hatov, recognizing the good. Mm. Um, and this morning, I, I don't know if you noticed, but there were these beautiful rainbows. Yeah. I just took a, a beautiful picture of the rainbow by the house and then by the church mm. um, and just really recognizing the good. And then actually just yesterday, uh, the Humble Interfaith Fellowship met mm -hmm. and um, somebody said, who wants to begin with an invocation? And this young man was like, who was his first time? He said, I don't I don't know what that is, but I see a rainbow outside. Um, and that seems like a good sign. And then Rabbi Nomi gave a. A Hebrew blessing that is mm. meant to be said when one sees a rainbow. Wow, um, that's beautiful. Hakarat Hatov. So thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Um, gratitude is the antidote. Gratitude is the vaccine, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm so glad you got vaccinated. That's actually the that's really one of the main things that we at the Interfaith Fellowship are focusing on is encouraging people in Humboldt County to get vaccinated. Nice to Good. increase that percentage. Yep, yep. Thank you so much. And please thank um, Jason and your family and your churches for <laughs> letting us have you for this Sunday. Yeah, thank you. This Bethany, has been awesome. Yeah, I hope the recording all worked out. If it didn't, then uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We'll have to do it again. All right, have all a right. good night. You too, take care. Blessings. I'll see you Sunday. Care.